Монгол данхудаа ухаалаг гар утсыг үн төлбөргүй авах урамшуулыг Mobicom дараа төлбөрт Signature багцын хэрэглэгчдтэй санал болгож байна. Та 7 дугаар сарын 9-ны өдрийг хүртэл өөр тойр байрлах Mobicom-ийн салбар дээр хүрэлцэн ирж үйлчлэгний гэрээтэйгээр сүүлийн үеийн ухаалаг гар утсыг үнэгүй болон онцгой хөнгөлөлтөд үнээр аваарай. Бидэнтэй хамт уйсан хэрэглэгч танд баярлалаа. Mobicom Сайн байцхан нөхөн төлөвчтэй өнөөдөр орой манай де фактоны төлөвлөгийн зочноор Америкийн нэгдсэн улсын батлан хамгаалах яамны сайдар хоёр удаа ажиллаж ирсэн ноён Доналд Рамсфелд оролцож байна. Good evening sir. Greetings. Welcome to Mongolia. Thank you. It's good to be back. What brought you to Mongolia this time? Well, this time I'm here uh, we have a conference of uh, Central Asian Caucasus fellows from Mongolia, Afghanistan and the Central Asian Caucasus countries. Wow. We're bringing in oh I think we'll have something like 65 Mm. of the uh, Central Asian fellow, Greater Central Asian Fellows. And then we'll have a total of about 90 people, uh, p- people who will give speeches and talks and panelists and outside visitors who will come. We have uh, former ambassadors and we have distinguished academic leaders like Dr. Fred Starr from Johns Hopkins University at the Central Asian Caucasus Institute. And uh, it's, 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 a, it's a gathering we bring together once a year. This will be our fourth conference of this type. And different countries? Well, ten countries, countries. Ten countries. I uh, see. And uh, they're all people from this part of the world. And uh, we, we decide each year where we're going to be. And this year it was in Mongolia. And uh, they all wanted to come to Mongolia from Central Asia and the good, Caucasus. Good time, by the way. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what is that about? It, Why is that so important? <laughs> Well, what it, the, the people are largely from non-governmental organizations, government, business, the, a few from the military, academic world, mm. some journalists, uh, and they, they have been part of a program that we started, I guess, in 2008. Uh, we bring to the United States uh, 10 people, one from each country generally, each of the ten countries, and uh, they come to the United States, they meet with a lot of people, and then they go back home. And uh, they have now clustered in and meet together, and there's a really a network that's evolved. It's, network it's of been, same-minded young people. F- yeah, they're all, when they start, they're ages 29 to 40. Wow. And we've been doing it for six years, so they're now 49 to, or t- 29 to 50. Uh, and, and they get together in their all home countries. Yes. They talk among themselves yes. and they have a network, a uh, social, you yeah. understand at yes. your age, you understand these social network things. How right? important Facebook is and all that, yeah. <laughs> uh, at 83, 82 years old, I'm not quite into all of that digital stuff. But you said just this morning you have sent a very long email. It was about 10 or 12 words 12 for words. me. That's long for me, yeah. <laughs> By the way, about long and short about words. Why words is better when the reports things when they are shorter? Because you have been in defense, defense secretary of the huge country two times, and it should be, and you are a military person all your life. And no, short- no, I was 20 years in business. I ran okay. a pharmaceutical company, an electronics company. I yep. was so, chairman of a biotechnology even company. Even so, why it's important to express brief and short, clear? Well, first of all, clarity in communications, the, the reason for communicating, of course, is to be understood. Exactly. <laughs> not confused. Yeah, <laughs> you need not be confused. It's not to hear yourself talk. <laughs> It's to be okay. understood. So uh, I think uh, keeping things relatively short and, and ho- looking for clarity. You know, in the pharmaceutical business, if there's some, any slight confusion, those products go in people's bodies and they can die if there's a mistake. Yes. In the military, if people are confused and uh, there's ambiguity in what they say, uh, people can die uh, and, and make a mistake that they, they wouldn't want to have made. So I think um, clarity has a virtue. Well, that's... And you do too in your business. Well, we have to write nowadays very sure. short. I write every week in two languages. And within 800 words, you have to include everything what you want to tell, not more, two pages. No, you don't have to include everything you want to tell. You have to include everything you want them to hear. Correct. That, that would that very clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk back about this uh, Kamka, because 
this is about security, you said, about defense issue. And with that concept, Mongolia... No, it really of, isn't. Huh? This program really has nothing to do with defense. Okay. It, it has to do with the people in the region mm. coming together, meeting each other. Mm. What, what I've found is when we bring 10 at a time twice a year to the United States, and I ask them, how many of the other nine countries have you visited? Uh -huh. The answer generally is none or one or two or three. One person, I think, had visited six or seven of the other countries. There's not a lot of travel between these countries. If, if you go on sure. to go someplace, they go to Moscow or to Istanbul. Or there is no even the straight flights, correct. But they don't yes. take vacations. They don't do a lot of cross-nation business between the Central Asian and Mongolia and Caucasus countries. And, and, and the, the, what's happened is they, the people have come to know each other, these 122 fellows that, that have been part of this program, and uh, they now communicate with each other. And the largest number of them are in business. Uh, not, there's all, very few, three or four in, mm -hmm. out of the 122, maybe three or four have military backgrounds. But the 60-some-odd are from business and, when and you the have, NGOs. When you start to have this sort of ideas, really watching, observing, this sort of non-almost almost cooperation among these countries, when and why you have started to observe that situation? Well, it, it's interesting. I'm from Chicago. And we had a lot of Poles and Czechs and Slovaks in Chicago. Mm. And so when the communist system broke up, and they had relatives in Chicago. Mm -hmm. We had people from Lithuania, we had all these people, and they, they had friends and connections, and they talked. We didn't have a lot of people from this part of the world. And I had to travel here when I was in government quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, been to this country several times now, and, and have always enjoyed it and benefited from the visit. But so too with the other Central, A the Central Asian and Caucasus countries. And it struck me that it, it would, might be an interesting thing to take a foundation and to try to include some of those people uh, together in experiences around the United States, which we've now done. And uh, it turned out that, that, that w that's happened, and a lot of people in the United States, they meet with very prominent people in the United States. Those people have to sit down and focus on this part of the world. Yep, this is a great opportunity for these people. And, huh? and, uh, but then what's happened is, really, what's been most important is not that at all. What's mm -hmm. just, it's just through fortuity, mm -hmm. we find that these people have, have formed a network among themselves. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with the United States. Mm -hmm. And they meet together within their countries. Yep. They get together. The, the, the group from Mongolia, I think there's 10 or 11 the fellows who've now come from Mongolia, they are terrific. They're all doing well in their fields in business and government and different things. Very nice to hear. Talented, that. and uh, it's been just, they've been helping to organize the conference. Mm. And the people from the other nine countries are all very enthusiastic. They're starting to arrive uh, here in this country and, and looking forward to it. How do you see a role of Mongolia in, the, in this region? Well, it's interesting. Uh, it, it has not been considered part of Northeast Asia by the Northeast Asian countries, although there's an interest both ways. Mm. It has not been considered itself part of Central Asia or the mm. Caucasus, obviously. Uh, and yet the interest in Central Asia and the Caucasus in Mongolia is high. And the interest in Northeast Asia, uh, I hope, is high and interested. Um, it's an important country, Mongolia. It's big. It's, it's uh, active, it's energetic, people are doing things, and uh, I'm, my feeling is that, that it's not a surprise to me at all that so many people from the other nine countries are so excited about coming here, mm. in almost every case for the first time in their lives. Mm. And these are people who are active in business and doing things, mm -hmm. but they've not been here. And yeah. so we're pleased that Probably they're coming. Also because Mongolia is I mean, one of few countries in that part of the world trying to uh, sort of absorb what the democracy kind of values, democratic values give to your life, to life of the society, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. it gives you freedom of speech. Nobody restricts what you talk as before. Nobody stops you where you want to go. Mm -hmm. So people now start to feel. Now this country try to take back this uh, freedom there will be a war. Oh, yeah. So that democratic value is coming very deep set. How do you see that uh, today? 
Oh, you have been visiting several times. Well, you know, I'm an American, and, and if you think of our country, we have a system today that happens to fit us today. It didn't fit us 50 years ago. Correct. Or 100 years ago. We had a, a very different system. Yep. In our country, we, there were slaves in the United States into the 1800s. Women didn't vote into the 1900s. So we've evolved. Every country evolves. And the, the, the approach that, a, that fits a country at any one moment is a function of their history, their culture, their na uh, neighbors, and, and it's going to evolve and change. And Mongolia is today different than it was 20, 30 oh, years ago. By a, very much so. But it's going to be different again in another 20, 30 years, just as the United States is evolving. The important thing is, in your country, and here in this country, with that value, economic freedom also, and the economies are coming better and better. Of course, there is ups and downs, but exactly. overall, yeah. people are set to live better, more freedom, etc. Sure. So in that sense, how do you find what kind of opportunities are in between United States and Mongolia in the economy or in, um, say, uh, security issues? Well, obviously, we have a good military-to-military uh, -military relationship between the United States and Mongolia and between the United States and uh, countries in Central Asia and, uh, and the Caucasus. And that's a good thing to have. It's helpful. And, uh, Mongolia has been very active in peacekeeping around the world, which has been a good thing for the world to have that contribution. The very smallest high country coming, no? Pardon me? Smallest country army is coming for peacekeeping to... It's been terrific. It, it's a terrific contribution that Mongolia makes. And a, a, as I say, on a per capita basis, it's very high in, in the world. And the advantage is, of course, it helps the, the UN peacekeeping ap operations, but it also helps Mongolia because your soldiers get to meet, work with other soldiers, they learn, they develop relationships, and that's all a good thing. A lot of social changes happening with this sol soldiers traveling and visiting other countries, mm -hmm. watching other nations. And now I think even, you know, many soldiers, according to the interview I noticed, they have changed their mind about poverty. Oh, interesting. And they said, look, it's not poverty. You should go there to oh, exactly. sweep down to see this poverty. Yeah, they see what's going on in other parts of the world and how difficult it That's can be. That's what is, I think, another some value that we never notice. But it's coming. I'll tell you, one of my favorite photographs uh. is the photograph of the Korean Peninsula. Uh -huh. You have the same people in the south and the north. Yes. You have the same resources in the south and the north. You have yes. the same neighbors yeah. in the south and the north. Even more people the in the same, north. <laughs> the same culture. Yes. And it, the photograph at night from a satellite shows pitch black except for a pinprick of light in Pyongyang, and in the south it's just brilliant with electricity. And, and the only difference is a free system, a free political system and a free economic system in the south. That's why. And that people are starving in the north. It's so tragic. Хайхуутай that's why here in Mongolia we have so much obsessed with this learning better, faster, implementing here faster. But of course, there is a, it's a lot of mineral dependent economy the here and there problems, corruptions bad governance, we, but the good thing is, we talk about that. No, but That's good to talk openly. And then we discuss it, and yeah. then we change it, and then we change the whole system. I, could, the I could sit in New York or Chicago and decide where I wanted to put a pharmaceutical plant or a research facility anywhere in the world. And, and I could sit there in my office and decide that. And where would I put it? I would put it where there was an environment that was hospitable mm -hmm. to investment, where the rule of law mm -hmm. 
was, was in place, and you had reasonable certainty that, that if you obey the law, that you could come out a certain way. You'd, you'd go where uh, corruption was, was not there. Now, corruption's in a lot of places, but, but you, you, corruption is so corrosive of democracy. Mm. Uh, it just tells a citizen <clears throat> in a democracy that they don't play by the rules. So corruption is an is a important part of where you want to put something. So in that sense, it. would you consider Mongolia to open <clears throat> your branch today? Would I consider it what? To open your branch of that pharmaceutical company. Well, the, the other thing sense. you want to consider is the country looking like it's, it's moving in the right direction. Mm. It isn't, is it perfect? Because no country is perfect. But which way yes. is the country going? Is the, is the government and the people wanting to go in a forward, positive direction yes. a, towards the rule of law and away from corruption, or is it reverting? Is it kind of stopped? And I want to put my, my investments in a, in a place where I think they're going in the right direction. And I think Mongolia, as you say, is, is going to have some ups and downs like we all do in every country, but clearly Mongolia is, is on a journey from a very different system. Yes, within my life, 25 exactly. years, this has changed so much. It's enormous. We change. cannot even recognize our city. Yeah. Oh, I know. It's a yeah. beautiful city. It's growing so fast. It, just in the times I come back, it changes. You see, you said about uh, the mood, the direction of people, of the, so the society. I think, in spite of my writing every week very critically about our governance, I feel that we go to that right direction. Directionally, yeah. I agree. So I agree. Thank you very much for that. Let's come again back to, uh, uh, you know, we are looking for diversifying our economy from mining to other sectors, where then we have to talk and to have uh, bilateral, multilateral relations. And so we are looking to the East, trans-Pacific cooperation to U.S., to Latin America, to we want to be APEC member, etc. We, we have recently accomplished a uh, free trade agreement with Japan. Mm -hmm. and I saw that. Yeah, and we're looking for this sort of cooperation. <coughs> How do you see that? Well, I think you get, if, you, if you look at your near neighbors in Japan and, and Korea and Taiwan, uh, and then going down towards uh, Singapore and Australia and India, in this immediate part of the world, we have some really amazing success stories. True. And uh, the greater the interaction in the, towards the Pacific, it seems to me, is all positive for the <clears throat> Northeast Asian countries as well as for Mongolia. By the same token, the Central Asian and Caucasus countries are going through a journey themselves, a little different in each country, uh, different from Mongolia, uh, and different from each other. But they're directionally going in the right direction, it seems to me. And, and, and the opportunity there is significant. This is an important part of the world uh, between here and the Caucasus countries. And uh, it is a country with uh, a, a, an active, interested population that does not think of itself as a region. True. Uh, and as a region, it's more important than it is than any one country among the ten countries may be, which is not a surprise. But it seems to me that, that Mongolia is in a wonderful position. It can benefit from the relationships in Northeast Asia, mm -hmm. but it also can benefit by becoming and being a part of the evolution in Central Asia, which is... Uh, I would think one day, uh, instead of having a bilateral agreement with which each nation, mm -hmm. maybe to have something that every nation is together, in one document or in one uh, treaty, mm -hmm. so that we, we <coughs> save a lot of time mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. I, that I, what I mean is a trans-Pacific partnership. Either. Sure. No, I, I agree. I think that, that trade, opening trade opportunities among countries, to be sure it can have an, a, what a, seems to be an adverse effect in some specific industries, but in the aggregate, it benefits everybody. Mm. And uh, I've been a strong promoter of U.S. free trade agreements for many, many years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I recognize the fact that it creates some adjustments that are necessary. Mm -hmm. But uh, overall, people benefit. They get more products at a better price, better quality. Mm -hmm. It's more competitive. 
uh, and competition is, some people say, well, that's bad. I always have thought competition is good because it makes you better. Yep. Competition is making not only you better, but the whole society better, exactly. isn't it? And, and I was a wrestler, so I like competition. That's the question I want to ask. <laughs> Which kind of wrestling? Freestyle. Freestyle. Yeah, not Greco-Roman or sumo. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> no. No, you've got great wrestlers in this country. Yeah, I mean, in the whole type of wrestling, the Mongols go there and take in number one or number two oh, positions. Terrific. Well, why is that so? I don't, I don't understand. Well, why? Because people who pay attention to something and work hard at it get good at it. Have you seen Mongolian wrestlers? Yes. And I don't care to wrestle them. I'm too, <laughs> I'm, I'm too old. <laughs> well, uh, for your age, I mean, uh, I wish people would look and be so energetic. Uh, but I'd like to ask a few questions about that part of uh, your life. Um, you were a Navy pilot. Yes. And of, when you were a Navy pilot, the ships were of that long as today, or? No, no, they're much smaller. Smaller. Yeah, and yeah the, the ships today are enormous. They're, I was there for the Gerald Ford christening of the ship and okay. commissioning of the ship. And the flight deck on the USS Gerald Ford aircraft. The carried, longest one that time? Five acres. Wow. Five acres. It's, in meters would be... I'll leave Less the complicated mathematics to you. <laughs> it, it's an enormous... So it, it requires a completely different mindset from that time, a Navy pilot, than now. Yeah, and of course they, they, have, a, they have a wire that catches a hook, and, mm -hmm. and they have a barrier if you miss the wire, and they have a candid deck so you can go off and not hit anything else if you want. But you have a wire to stop it. Yeah. My father was on an aircraft carrier during World War II. Oh. So as a young... 10, 12-year-old, I, I was uh, around San Diego and that Navy town, and it became a part of my All life. All the Rumsfelds yeah. were military guys. <laughs> yeah. No, but they, they were private citizens. They, and I was, I was uh, on active duty for about three and a half years, and then in the reserves for another 10 or 12. So, uh, but uh, well, not a career Navy person. No. I understand. I mean, you had the highest possible position in the military career in the, in the whole world. You were twice this uh, defense ministry of, uh, we, we call it ministry, but secretary sure. of defense in the U.S. How important is this, uh, this sort of sport mind, sport activities in, for anybody? How, how do you find Athletics? It? Yes. Athletics. <laughs> no, in general, uh, the, I mean, fitness to be, all this oh, exercise. Sure, yeah. How do you, how do, you do that? I wrestled for 12 years. Okay. Think of that. Uh, no, I think that athletics are good for everybody. If you want to live a long and healthy life, being active in some sport or another, it doesn't make a lot of difference which one. What sport keeps you that strong at this age after 18? What? I played, uh, I, I snow skied twice in January this year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I, uh, I play squash, uh -huh. um, which you can go down and... You do it now? I do now. Well, oh. not very well. And my wife taught me the way you play squash. Uh, you know, with a little racket and a ball, yes. is you learn to say good shot to your opponent and don't, <laughs> and don't try for it. <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> you made a book called Ramos for the Rules. Mm -hmm. It was mistitled because <laughs> most of the things are not rules. Okay. They're ideas, they're thoughts, they're observations. And almost all of them came from people an awful lot smarter than I am. They're observations, really, uh, that I've accumulated. I, my mother was a school teacher, mm. and so what I did, she always made me carry a little three by five card like that, uh -huh. and I'd write down anything that someone said that I thought was really brilliant. Mm. And so I've got quotes in there from an awful lot of smart people. Yeah. And have you read the book? I have seen the title. I'm not trying to do so. <laughs> well, next time I see you, there'll be a quiz. All right. <laughs> okay. And with that note, uh, making a note. I have the same habit as well. Really? Oh, yes. Okay, and really I find very important. Now, mm -hmm. Nowadays it's your phone, you know, you, you do yeah, it in two languages very agree. fast. <laughs> uh, were any, uh, you, you served with two presidents. You had the, the highest... Uh, four presidents. Four presidents. Yeah. And on the two presidents you were the military Secretary number defense, one guy. Yeah. Do you recall anything, any event that it, this your note played crucial role? that your habit of making a note 
carrying that. Well, one, <clears throat> one interesting one was Gerald Ford was the only president who was never elected president or vice president because we had a resignation of a president and a vice president. So in our entire history, we never had a person go into that office who was not prepared. He was a legislator. He was not an executive. He had never run. He wasn't known to the people of the world. Why he, he was uh, uh, selected? He was selected. By, by, he was appointed vice president, and then the, the president resigned, and he became president. president. So the American people didn't know much about him. Uh -huh. The world didn't know much about him. But you should know him. Well, I well. served in Congress with him, uh -huh. so we were friends. In fact, he was the only president I worked with who was a personal friend. And uh, the, I was with him one day, and we were in the Oval Office, and I said um, something like, what you measure improves. Or if you rephrase that in, into military talk, you get what you inspect, not what you expect. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, inspect. So, so he said, well, what's, measure. what's uh -huh. that about? And I said, well, that's just some businessman said, if you can't manage if you can't measure. Yes. <clears throat> and what you measure, if you tell people you're going to measure that, it'll get better. And, and they'll know that that's, you care about that. And he said, well, then where did you get that? And I said, well, I, smart people say that, so I write it down. And he said, do you have other things like that? And I said, yes. <laughs> and he said, well, write them up. I want to see them. So I took all my rules out of a file and had my secretary type them up. And that's what became Rumsfeld's rules. He, he labeled them, President Ford, labeled them Rumsfeld's rules. Tell me about your children, grandchildren, how many of them? Well, I have seven children, and um, so three children, seven grandchildren, and I now have two great-grandchildren. Wow. And it doesn't take a genius to have a great-grandchild. <laughs> All you have to do is live <laughs> with them. There, there you are. Uh, because this is the end of almost our interview, what you would tell a young a Mongolian uh, a kid to come to school now, a primary school, mm -hmm. what, is the, what you would tell your young grandchild when they start to go to school? What will be the, the word you would tell them? Well, in life, one of the most enjoyable things you can do is to learn. And if you're learning, if you're not learning, you can get bored. If you're doing something over and over and over, your mind starts to stray. So I, I think a young person always ought to try to find a way to put themselves in a circumstance where they're learning, where they're with people who are intelligent, where they're with people who've done things they've never done, where they're with people who have a decent sense of humor. So they, when they get up in the morning, they want to go be with those people because they're enjoyable. Because they'll work harder, they'll spend more time with them, they'll learn more. Indeed. You have really a person of humor. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to Mongolia. And uh, I wish all the best to your children, grandchildren, grand-grandchildren. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Enjoyed it. I'm not sure if you get American youth to sing. But I'm going to say that 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 I'm going to Yep. All right. Now you can. Mongol Tanghuta, Ohatha Mobicom, Taratulpur, Signature Baxin Hirgitic Ding, Sansos Chuan, Ta, Doltwasrin, you snew, Dripurtis, or Tur Barrett of Mobicom in Salpurti Purtsin Irch, Uchini Gritiger, Sutin Wing, Ohatha Karotsik, Unugu was an onshoe Hungustunir, Avara. Didn't they have to sing Hirgitic Tent by Mobicom.